Good evening. How's everyone doing? Great. Great. So the human race to which most of us belong to, we are zoning into subatomic levels of engineering. We are trying to get into genomics, nanotechnology, as Gretchen mentioned. And by the way, I'm going to see a lot of as Gretchen already mentioned. Um, we are trying to really get into subconscious emotions and thoughts of people. We are trying to take change in our own hands by ignoring governments and large corporations. And so if you look at everything as pyramids, we are really creating a new bottom of the pyramid here. And this bottom is being redefined. And the aging population is now part of this bottom. And so are a lot of us out here. We're only scratching the surface of this bottom. The aging population, a um, lot of you know the statistics, but I'll quickly take uh, a second on that. A uh, billion people, 60 plus years, in less than 10 years. And 30% of the world's population is going to be 60 plus in less than 40 years. And most of us will be in that space. So we're really trying to talk about what kind of world we want to create for ourselves. What are we trying to create as a society, as systems, as policies that will make the world a better place for us? Um, can I get rid of this cross thing? Um, basically, going back to what Katie was mentioning, that aging is no longer a challenge or a burden on society, but it's a great idea to look at it as an asset, as an opportunity. And um, again, as Gretchen already talked about, um, in order to innovate for the space for the aging user community, we need to really take an empathy-led approach. We need to understand what they really need. Last year, when my dad had a stroke, it took us, uh, the entire family, down. We just could not understand his challenges, his emotional or mental needs. And um, it, was, it was a bit difficult for us to understand what do we need to do to make his life better now. So in order to get everybody on the same page, I insisted that the entire family ties up their left arm in a sling and live like him for a week. You guys want to try that? Just hold your arm and not move it and try to take your jacket out with one hand. That's, that's pretty difficult. Now, no, no amount of medical consultation can really help you understand these deep needs of somebody going through a condition unless you immerse yourself in that situation. And that basically is what empathy. It, you need to understand what's going on under the hood. Again, as Gretchen already said, what they say, what they communicate is very different from how they're really feeling from deep inside. And so you need to open the hood and look under, uh, underneath. Identify behavior patterns. Understand their emotional needs. Understand their physical needs by immersing yourself, maybe pretending to be in their condition, or just kind of like the guy who took the camera across the hospital and was trying to imagine how will it be if I were in this place. And connect with them. If you really want to define solutions for this community, you need to connect with them. You need to have them talk about what they're going through so that you can create better solutions for them. Um, when we start talking about solutions, we generally gravitate towards technology. And I'm not against technology, but I would suggest we start looking at behavior change models. Why is this important? Because aging has had a huge impact on our behaviors, our individual behaviors, uh, people we live with, and society in general. What we need to really look at is a change in behavior, one step at a time, that's going to enable us to create empathy for this group, um, enable adherence, eliminate discrimination, and create policy level changes that will enable these group of people to live a better life. And um, what I would recommend is look at some behavior models that are out there. I'm a great fan of BJ Fogg, who runs the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab. He talks about looking at small steps, simple actions that enable you to lead, to create significant impact. He talks about triggers, and technology is a great source of triggers that enables people to take actions towards the goal that they have set for themselves. So we might want to look at uh, more human, more psychological, more social solutions over and above technology that we are all so passionate about to help these senior citizens drive uh, towards independence. <clears throat> As I said, I'm not against technology. I believe that technology is very empowering. 
Um, it really has the potential at the scale that we're looking at to change the lives of um, aging people. But technology has to be easy on them. We really can't create technology the way we create for a different demographic, for younger people or people in the developed world. So I would insist that everyone try and think about how intuitive their technology solutions could look like. And I'll give you an example. I was reading about this hacker who decided to hack a Kinect system, a gaming system, to enable his mom to move her hands in the air so that she could use gestures to send emails to him. That's a very simple solution, and for the user, it's just about moving her hands in the air, and she's able to perform a highly technological feat, which is sending an email. Or, um, or the, um, the recent example in Forbes about the patient briefcase. It's a highly complex device that has been developed for doctors to monitor patients uh, remotely. It's, it's complex enough to monitor um, electric signals, heart rates, blood pressure, pretty, pretty uh, you know, decent stuff. But for the patient, all he gets to see in, in front of him is a call button. And that's, that's pretty serious stuff in terms of looking at interaction design. How do users interact with the technology or the devices or the solutions you're creating? Integrate that into their life so they, they don't have to create additional tasks or steps to, to understand what you're offering them or to in, engage with it. And the last part of my presentation is around open innovation. Again, as Gretchen already mentioned, don't be shy to let people into your design and development process. Last month, we organized an event called the Protothon, where we invited a very diverse set of uh, professionals to come and co-create with us um, educational products for children. Um, it, was, it was a very successful event, I think, because we also did something very unique. We invited children to our event. And these kids served as great user segments for us. They provided us with the what, so what we could design, how we could design, but most importantly, why we should be designing what we have in mind. And so think about involving people from the user community to help you co-design, or think of really extreme cases where you could bring in a chef to teach you about how you could you know, build things, or really extreme industries, and get those perspectives. And again, um, when you're co-designing with people, make sure you have some very quick and dirty prototypes, you test, propose, test, iterate, and keep doing that till you get it right. I think that uh, that is a great way to design for a community that is not as tech savvy, hasn't been brought up with technology, and is not open to such a drastic change in everyday interfaces and applications. So you wanna keep making sure that they get comfortable with what you're designing. And I guess that is my really short presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Otherwise, it'd be great for you to talk to me for a minute about sure. uh, one day at a time. Yes. Uh, I'm throwing this on you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'll take questions and maybe wrap it up with one day at a time. Yeah. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about your, is it a protocon? Yes, yes. Sure. Um, so, protocon is a take on hackathon, but mostly focused on building prototypes. So uh, we decided to come up with um, uh, prototypes around concepts for education for elementary school children. The idea was to create hands-on learning products and services. Um, we went through the ideation process, we did a lot of brainstorming, and um, the group of people was divided amongst professionals and children alike. So we had people um, working with kids to get insights and ideas. And um, we've come up with about four different concepts, uh, most probably, uh, mostly in the areas of project management and products for hands-on learning for STEM areas. And uh, this was done in San Francisco last month. Yeah. Great, sure. Another question, yeah. Hi. So what do you mean specifically by natural user interface? Okay, yeah, so, um, Natural user interface is a mechanism of using natural gestures, so voice, sight, motion, gestures, for example, to interact with technology. Um, in, the, in the last 20 to 30 years, we have been focusing a lot of, on graphical user interface. Touchscreen, for example, is a way of transcending from graphics to natural. You're touching something. It's a very natural way of using technology. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, go ahead, please. All right, like, we, we're saying that uh, elderly people are not used to technology. 
easy to use for anyone it should be easy for them to pick up too but the thing is depends on who you're designing for if you have got the average developed world candidate or user he's going to be you know more open to that but try in developing worlds they are not used to any form of interface which is technical at all so even a simple cell phone can be intimidating for them try sms for example it's a difficult technology for a lot of seniors in those worlds so depends on who your user is I find a lot of seniors struggling with iPads, for example. So. I find a lot of seniors who struggle with iPads in you know different geographies. It's not such a no-brainer for them. Yeah. Well, which is why I thought we should talk about behavior change and more human solutions, not so much technology. But yes, in the developing world, it is a challenge to take just an iPad as your silver bullet that this is going to solve all the problems. It doesn't. Yeah. Actually, but, uh, just to add to that, you would be very surprised with the iPod. They do perfectly well. The iPod. They are having a lot yeah. of fun in the developing world with the iPod. The same person is uh, finding the iPad a little strange. Yeah, and, and I guess there are some people in the room who are talking about sensors, for example, and that's serious technology. Um, sure, you guys have heard about Nest, uh, the thermostat that learns about you. It's pretty freaky, right? You, there's a thermostat in your room that knows when you leave the house and when you're back, and that's invisible technology, but there's a lot of stuff like that uh, which is based on sensors that captures data about you and you can interact with it. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, last one. I worked very early back in the 80s on teaching older people, introducing older people to computers. This was pre Windows, this was DOS. This is not a friendly technology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in those days, this notion that, that an older person might be interested in the computer was kind of a zany idea. Um, why would they want to do this? And what we found was that many older people are perfectly capable of learning how to use even fairly challenging technology. Yeah are given the right kind of helping, yeah. friendly uh, introduction. And I think sure. the step that is most often missed is the human support. You can't just put the technology in people's hands yes. and they'll grab it and use it if they're older. They Absolutely. Need to be trained. But if you, if you give them that help, get them over that barrier Absolutely. of familiarity with the ear, my belief is they actually can be very sophisticated in their, in their use. Sure. But Absolutely. I think that's the missing component. So, Sure. Um, I'd actually take it back one step further um, in the sense of there needs to be a strong value proposition. They need to want to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. In fact, I, 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 I would say they're not interested in technology yeah. per se. What they're interested in is the way I used to say that they don't want to learn how to hammer and saw, they want to learn how to make a bookshelf. Yeah. I think it's all about making it personally relevant and accessible and something yeah. that yeah. they have a desire to do, and how they do it is. Second. It's like a lot of them pick up Skype because they want to communicate with their grandchildren, not yeah. because they're really into video conferencing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's scary, right? Well, yeah. I like your perspective as ageless, and I think it's great, and I think it's um, a real answer to making this a, a big market is to just think about it as ageless. And what we can learn from older adults as an extreme user, but really they're going to just show you latent needs in the population often. Yes. I was just going to make a point that we're looking at, you know, even if we started at 55, which I believe is relatively young, you know, 55 to 75, most of those people are computer literate and they are technology knowledgeable. They are aware of technology. So I, I wouldn't agree with your point uh, mm -hmm. based on my experiences. And um, I just think that as we start looking into the future, you know, of uh, technology and living at home and all the different things that we, we want to make our lives easier and enjoyable, mm -hmm. I think the accessibility
acceptance and use of technology and the training that, that um, my psychology over here mentioned is absolutely crucial and very true. So sure. I think for 85 plus year olds who are trying to use an iPad, I think that's more of a challenge. Yeah. But looking at the baby boomer group is, is, is very opportunistic. Well, that, that applies very well to the developed world. But in the developing countries, I have an 83-year-old father-in-law which, uh, who just started using an Apple Mac. And it took us a lot of time, a lot of training, a lot of human support to get him off uh, you know, a new technology. But he's doing great right now. So you do need to provide that human support. Yeah. Great. Right. Thank you, everyone.